I'm going to try and convince you about whether or not non-compaction is something to lose sleep over or not. I don't have uh, any disclosures related to this topic or any other, but I do mention that I have five kids at home and I could really use a few disclosures. So uh, if, you, if you have any opportunities, I, I'm in. So if you look at uh, non-compaction, it's really been around for a long time. Uh, first described in the late 1960s, and over the last three or four decades, we've seen descriptions when, whether it's by echocardiogram in the mid 80s or late 90s as uh, by cardiac MRI, it was initially described as, quote, spongy myocardium here in the early 1960s, and then in association with other diseases like my, uh, mitochondrial diseases or neuromuscular disorders. And along the way, we've had some challenges with its considerable, uh, whether or not it's a significant contributor or not. So some have said that the reason why we think it's so rare is because at autopsy, when you die in systole, the compacted myocardium disappears and we don't see it. So that in life, these are much more visible than during autopsy, so we miss it. Others have said that really it's just an association with other diseases, that it's more related to congenital heart disease. And if you look at genetic testing and mutations that are associated with it, there's a lot of overlap between dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other diseases we've already mentioned. So complicated whether or not it is truly related to problems or just associated. But when you make the diagnosis, if you call it non-compaction, there's some significant concern related to it. So it, based on limited data, there is a concern with regards to arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia, heart failure, death and transplant have all been associated with left ventricular non-compaction and even embolic disease. So calling something LV non-compaction carries a potential risk associated with it and we're left sorting that out. So the diagnostic criteria has evolved and what most folks are settled on is these three criteria, specifically the CHIN and the, and the Jenny criteria. And what they look at is that myocardium that is compacted, and they use perfusion imaging like this um, color Doppler here to look at those trabeculated spaces. And what they identify is the non-compacted part of the myocardium and compare that to the second layer of, con of dense compacted myocardium, and they come up with a ratio. So if you're using that criteria, use three trabeculations of three millimeters deep or more, and they identify that as a non-compacted to compacted ratio uh, at, end, uh, at end systole of greater than two, or the X and Y ratio where you're comparing the entire thickness compared to the compacted at end diastole of uh, less than 0.5. So that's the accepted criteria for this. Now the challenge is with athletes, we often see that. We, we see this reported on echoes as hypertrabeculation or this hypertrabeculated pattern at the apex, and that's how we make the diagnosis, based on what we think we are identifying. Many times they meet criteria for non-compaction, even in the normal, seemingly normal athlete, and we are left trying to sort that out. Now the first problem is that assessing ejection fraction by volumetric assessment, which is the, typically the standard we use, is, is complicated if you are unable to identify the endocardium. So if there's a compacted myocardium that makes it more difficult to trace end systole and end diastole, the ejection fraction are often under-recognized. So we often call a low ejection fraction when it is indeed normal. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that we've already heard this, right? The ventricles of, uh, related to athletes are often dilated. And what we often don't talk about is that in some instances, the ejection fractions can be in that low normal range, 45 to 50% described in the cycling athletes where their ventricles are quite large, half over 60 millimeters. And we, we saw the same in the NBA. Just recently uh, published data in 2016, ejection fractions of around 50% or higher despite having completely normal diastolic function. So we think these are all normal athletes with ejection fractions that are low normal, not quite completely normal, and the ventricles are often dilated. So because of that, we're seeing more trabeculations at the apex because it's more easily visible, and oftentimes we're calling it because it meets criteria. So for that reason, we've seen a number of authors recently start to question the diagnosis of left ventricular non-compaction. Is this truly a reason to restrict? 
Now, Dr. Sharma is here, so I'm going to try and do justice to his study, the largest of which, over 1,100 patients, where he said, at the end of it, his conclusion was, I'm concerned. Maybe there needs to be more stringent criteria. And we looked at over uh, nearly 1,150 patients, mostly men, mostly white, and what he found was that of those 1,150, about 1 in 10 met criteria for non-compaction. A lot, right? For those of you who are ordering echoes and wish you hadn't, this often comes back positive with this hypertuberculated pattern. And now what do you do with it? If you look deeper into this group, you see that the difference between those who met criteria and those who did not meet criteria, there wasn't a lot of difference between the ejection fractions of ventricular size or their diastolic parameters. They looked virtually the same, even though some had met criteria for, quote, non-compaction, and others did not. So if you dive a little deeper into that 93, what you find was no surprise, the majority of them had normal T waves associated with that criteria for non-compaction by echo by echo, that only a small number indeed had T-wave inversions, the ECG pattern you've heard a lot about this morning that uh, Dr. Bagish referred to, I think, as T-wave inebriation, that only a small pattern met that criteria that should make you sweat, and even a few others, a, a smaller number, 10, met that criteria with an ejection fraction under 50%. So again, look a little deeper into that group. What you found was that their ventricles are somewhat dilated, but many of them were normal. Their ejection fractions were in that low normal range, 45 to 52% or so, and their diastolic parameters were all normal. But most importantly, their outcomes were superb. No adverse events at a four to five year follow-up, leading us to say, perhaps this is more echo finding than important finding. So what they described was that in the athlete, the, ventricle ca the ventricular cavity dilates. Most of the time, the ECG is normal with upright T waves, and this is more of an epiphenomenon probably related to preload. That the, although they meet criteria for non-compaction, this is more of just a finding in the athlete. And they pointed to another study, which I found interesting, that, that they pointed to the preload that occurs during pregnancy. The normal ventricle starts to develop trabeculated pattern that resolves postpartum, also owing to this discussion that it's probably preload and a normal phenomenon. And that this other group with deep, deep T wave inversions with, a, with an ejection fraction that's reduced, perhaps this is the group we ought to spend a little more time being concerned about, despite having the good outcomes in this study. Appropriately, he took a step back, I think, and said there's still more work to be done, but perhaps this is the group that, we're gonna, that, that you may want to expand on and do, as Dr. Ackerman says, the drill. This might be the group that you'd, be, you'd get more complete on. So my take home point so far is dilated chambers and trabeculations, it's common. We often see it in athletes. It's probably nothing to get concerned about. It's most likely related to a preloaded heart. But are there high risk features that suggest it's pathology? When should you go a little deeper? So this is a study we did a number of years ago looking at strain when I was still at the Mayo Clinic. And we found that if you look at those with a, compared to control groups with an ejection fraction that was normal or an ejection fraction that was reduced, the strain values were indeed abnormal in those with a reduced ejection fraction compared with normal. So not enough numbers to draw a conclusion about outcomes, whether or not this can be prognostic or not, but strain imaging may help you feel more comfortable that this is truly a normal phenomenon. How about MRI? Now, we haven't talked about it. We're going to talk more about it tomorrow. But suffice it to say, this has become an important part of how we're going to evaluate athletes going forward. Most of the time, it's going to be with white blood imaging. But there's a role, indeed, for late gadolinium enhancement or scar assessment. So we've looked at other diseases like this, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVD, and dilated cardiomyopathy. And we've done the same for non-compaction. Now, the criteria is based on just a few studies. And the most, quote, validated, now I underline validated, because if you go back into that study, you'll find that the gold standard for evaluating MRI for non-compaction has a whopping seven patients included in the study. So most folks are using this criteria based on seven patients. Not quite a robust marker for this, but nonetheless, right now, the largest study we have.
And they used a little different criteria. They used diastole instead of systole. They still use that non-compacted to compacted myocardium, but the ratio of greater than 2.3. But perhaps it's more that you get from the MRI than you get from the echo. And what I would submit to you is that when you find something that looks like non-compaction, and it meets criteria by echo and perhaps MRI, that if you find scar tissue, this might be the risk factor that makes you sweat a little bit more. So if you go back to Dr. Sharma's data, he indeed used Peterson criteria, and they found no late gadolinium enhancement in any of their patients. So perhaps the group they looked at was already in that low risk category. They were indeed not at risk for, ha for having sudden cardiac arrest, and perhaps SCAR would have been the arbiter to separate risk from no risk. Because we know that fibrosis or SCAR by MRI has a poor outcome. Whether we're talking about infarct or dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, SCAR implies a, a poor outcome. The more SCAR, the worse outcome. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. So perhaps this is a helper for you to sort out whether or not this is truly something to be concerned about or not. So for MRI criteria, it's based on limited data. There's no true consensus about how to best utilize MRI for this disease. That LGE is not common. That maybe with more, with more study, we're gonna find out this is related to poorer outcomes. So is isolated LV non-compaction disease or normal variant? Hopefully I've convinced you that dilated chambers and hypertrabeculation is common. And that the majority of the time you're gonna find a normal ejection fraction, normal diastology or relaxation parameters, and no scar which is going to imply a good outcome. Most likely this is a normal athletic finding related to preload. And I would suggest that, as a, that this is not a sole reason for disqualification. Just finding hypertrabeculation without any other high-risk features is nothing that to do anything about. High-risk features suggesting pathology might include reduced ejection fraction, but make sure it's done correctly. As we said earlier, it can be often underestimated. Abnormal diastology or strain uh, parameters are going to suggest that there may be a higher risk, and that an MRI with SCAR may be the way we best sort out their risk long-term. And that's all I have. Thank you.